Tim, for those who don't know me, if you're, you're new or, uh, you know, if you just stumble on these videos or even if you've forgotten since the last one. Uh, so I'm sort of the instructory person here at the Old Sword Club. Uh, normally I do these lessons in person, but tonight, but right now we're doing them online because we're living through the end times. Oh, I'm okay. yeah. Not, not a fun time to be in New South Wales. Uh, but what is fun is what we're talking about tonight, which is Bowie Knife. Um, so for those who are wondering, uh, my Bowie Knife simulator tonight is actually one of the cold steel knife trainers, but with um, pipe insulation foam over it to make it more padded. So it's beautiful because it's like super flexy, but also like padded. So you can just like, I. Yeah, I mean, I still re recommend wearing gloves and a fencing mask when fencing with this, but yeah, it's it's really safe, which I like. Um, so tonight we're looking at 19th century bow knife fencing, or oh, 19th century knife fencing. Um, some of the manuals refer to what they're doing as dagger fencing, um, but this is kind of a, a really really interesting thing from the 19th century where um, there was a lot of interest in historical weapons in. Yeah, um, medieval daggers, renaissance era weapons um, with early HEMA. Um, and also there was a lot of interest in kind of a, lot, a big sense that weapon that warfare was going to change quite radically, um, particularly since the American Civil War. Um, and so, you know, there were people who were like, oh, well, maybe we, you know, maybe we should like be teaching soldiers to fight with knives because they're given knives, so why not fight with them? And then on top of that, you have, um, Sort of essentially the beginnings of modern self-defense where people are looking to defend themselves with something that they can carry and you can carry a knife um, whereas like the wearing of swords had pretty much by late 19th century had pretty much disappeared in europe um so yeah no you know there's sort of um efforts to kind of construct knife systems um by people like alfred hutton um in britain and also the defense dance Leroux practitioners like um andre and renault in france um, who were just like, all right, well, let's create a sort of a pressure tested, you know, fencing based system of knife fighting, which is what I do. Um, it's not, what I do is not um, these sort of more working class knife systems, uh, like the sort of, you know, bow and knife fighting of the old west necessarily. Um, although we actually don't know very much about the techniques of systems. All we have is a few newspaper articles that have essentially a series of like simple tricks that you can do with a bowie knife, but nothing resembling a full kind of, okay, you know, if you have to fight a duel with a bowie knife, here's what you use. But then, the other, but then by the same token, you know, you, it very well may be that like fencing knowledge was filtering down. Um, and certainly single, you know, single stick in the English speaking world was a working class fencing tradition for a very long time. So, yeah, who knows? Well, no one really, because we don't have any sources at this point. Um, anyway, let's start off. So I thought I'd start with something that required, means I don't have to get up straight away, which is how to hold the knife. So your basic means of holding the knife is, where the frick did I put my key? Like this, like a sabre type grip. So the way I achieve this is I get my hand, I lay my thumb down the back of the weapon, I like to press it up, at just gently against the guard um, so along the back of the handle here and then I take my uh, my first finger my pointer finger and I push up so I'm pushing the handle into the pad of my thumb from the other side and I take the tip of the finger and I use that to push the handle from this side into the palm of my hand so I've basically got pressure securing the weapon from um, all sides I then take my second finger and do this basically the same thing as I did with my first finger to give me a good degree of control. And then my bottom two fingers just gently rest on uh, the knife. And these hit here relax until it's time to go. At which point, you know, when I attack, the first thing I actually do is tense my bottom two fingers. Because uh, I find that's a really, really good cue to start basically snapping or to, you know, snap the knife out. Um, and it also means that I'm starting my, like the chain of muscles tensing all the way, you know, starting at my hand and then going up my arm so that I'm firing in basically the correct order, which is something I'll detail more when we talk about lunges. Um, one thing I also recommend once you've gripped the knife, bounce it back in your hand a bit, like just shake it back and forth, um, you know, slap it against things. Um, if you're using a sharp, please don't hit yourself. <laughs> in fact, don't, maybe don't train with the sharp necessarily. Um, but yeah, like just get, get used to having a bit of resistance 
um, just so that you've got um, so that you've got a proper grip, like you've got proper control on the weapon. Um, whereas you know, like you don't want to just try and copy me and be like, oh, but you know, Tim does it like this. Whereas you know, like my hands are a little bit different size to everyone else's, so the way you're going to hold a weapon is going to be a little bit different. All right, so let's actually look at some more of the kind of the technique end. Um, oh, if you have any questions along the way, just ask them in the chat. I won't get them to the, I won't get to them straight away, but I will periodically come back to my computer to check um, or to you know to drink some tea and stuff, and I'll check questions then. Um, so yeah, just ask questions whenever you think of them, and I'll answer them whenever I um I have the opportunity. All right, so let's look at the basic art. So the basic guard for the knife, knife fighting in most 19th century manuals in written documents to the systems is fairly similar to the standard guard you see for fencing, namely the medium guard. The feet, to form the guard, start with your feet in an L like this with the off side, so the non-knife side behind the knife side, knife side foot. And then all you're gonna do you step your feet till they're about two foot widths apart. Maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less, um, but roughly two foot widths. And you're going to sink down so that you've got a nice bend in your legs. The reason you want to bend in your legs is so that when you move, you've got nice, smooth, quick movement. If you stand too high, um, one of two things will happen. One is you'll bend, step, and straighten, in which case you've got a very slow, you've got two extraneous movements to do one step. Or well, the other thing, which is the much more common, is you'll walk like a pendulum. The problem with this is it's very big, it's very predictable, it's very obvious, it's also very committed. So it's not a good way to move. So bend your knees, and you'll know your knees are bent enough if you can move back and forth with your head not really bobbing down, up and down very much. So you can sort of see the line of the blinds behind me. My head is not bobbing down, up and down terribly much as I move back and forth. And hopefully the resolution on the camera is low enough that you know it's not bobbing up and down at all. So with your arm, your front arm, it bends at about 90 degrees, probably a little bit more, and rests with your elbow about a fist away from your torso. Um, you want to have it usually on the center line. So if you imagine my arm extended straight out, to touch my opponent, um, extend the straight out, this is the center line of the fight. The center line actually extends from the armpit because the weapon is on one side and human bodies aren't symmetrical, as opposed to, you know, like boxing where the center line stretches out from the center of the body. This, the center line comes out from basically the armpit, so I want my knife on the center line to maximize versatility. No one at about 90 degrees. I don't want it too high. I well, some, You can actually can do it lower if you like, um, but Having done a lot of other fencing, I find this very comfortable. Um, and I want to have my tip pointed low enough that if I extend, I will stab my opponent, but high enough that I can do a quick snappy cut to their front arm. The offhand is where it gets interesting because um, in some systems, Hutton, for example, recommends that you hold it here. So see up from the front, nice and next to my head. Um, it's not like a fen you know, it's not like a foil fencing hand position back here. It's forward. The closest thing is actually to a boxing hand position, uh, like a modern boxing hand position, but with the hand turned forward and a little bit away from the face so that you can grab and slap. Um, and Hutton, you know, that's what he recommends. Um, in the Defence Line Dans La Rue manuals, and I know I'm mispronouncing all the French, and I apologize for nothing. Um, if there's any French speakers out there who want to come and fight me, you know, that actually sounds really fun and we'll go to the pub afterwards. Um, but Defense Vendor would actually recommend that you sit your hand down here, uh, the way they describe it as like in boxing, uh, boxing stance like this, but a little more extended and open. So I'm sitting with my hand here. Uh, basically to do this, um, basically for the same purposes up here, I want to grab or slap the knife away. Um, but if it's here, it's quicker and it's closer. I quite like having um, my hand here. Whereas here, the hand is safer. Um, if you ever get someone who's really grabby, like their goal is to grab and stab, 
the easiest way to deal with it is just to target the offhand. And if you have your hand off, if you have your offhand down here, it will become a target very, very quickly. All right. So now we have your, now we have the stance. Let's look at the attack. So all of the cuts in um, all really all of the cuts and the thrusts have the same basic hand and arm motion. What varies is the angle of the weapon. Um, so if I'm going to thrust, I punch my arm out. It's just a quick extension. I don't want to retract it or bring it back for a big hacking motion or whatever. I want to just extend straight like I'm throwing a punch. Uh, this is for you know an attack done without footwork. Um, and if I'm doing a thrust, just, you know it's fairly obvious the blade just stays forward and I poke. If I'm doing a cut, as I extend, I let my tip drift back. I'm not pulling my tip back and going. I'm letting my tip drift back in flight to then snap out. Shut from the front. Tip goes back and snaps. Back and snaps. And the reason for that is I don't want to pull my tip back and telegraph my attack. I want to just snap it out as quickly as I can. And the power is not generate. The power is generated from basically flicking the arm. So very very simple. Flick, flick, flick. So let's actually try that. So we're going to tr first off. Once you try just the extending extending with the arm. I should check for questions. Get some big posts. Um, just you know, extend the arm. And I want you to focus on keeping on on not letting your tip drift back or not letting your hand drift back. So from here, extend, 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 extend. All right. Now what I want you to do is we're going to focus on that, but with cuts. So we're going to actually add some cutting. And the cuts are primarily with the wrist. I mean, you're going to get a little bit of elbow action in there just naturally. But when I cut, it's a quick flick. So I'm just lifting my tip up and bringing it down. So let's actually look at that using the Moulinet pattern you see in Sabre. So I'm going to extend, cut, retract, 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 extend, cut, retract. So I'll count these through um, just gently. Um, and I want you to follow along at home with these cuts. Um, and remember, the power comes from the flicking motion, just flicking a tip. And this does work. I mean, I've used this to chop branches and stuff um, with a machete. So yeah, it does generate sufficient power. So extend and cut one, retract. Extend, cut two, retract. Extend, cut three, retract. Extend, cut four, retract. Extend, cut five, retract. Extend, cut six, retract. Extend, cut seven, retract. Let's go through once again, once more, just for luck. Extend. Cut one, retract. Extend, cut two, retract. Extend, cut three, retract. Extend, cut four, retract. Extend, cut five, retract. Extend, cut six, retract. Extend, cut seven, retract. All right, now let's do that. We're gonna do the same cuts, but I'm gonna call them out at random. At random. Uh, and the reason I'm doing this is if you do things in a sequence, you, it's really good for short-term memory and rubbish for long-term memory. If you do things in a random order, you're much more likely to remember them long-term, but not quite as good for short-term memory. So the best solution is just to do both. So I'm gonna call a cut, I'm gonna mime it, and I want you to follow along. So let's start off with four, retract, one, retract, two, retract, six, Retract, five, retract, one, retract, three, retract, two, retract, seven, retract, three, retract, and two, retract. All right, so those are your basic cut angles and your basic extension cut. You do a lot of this, you know, just um, 
you're going to do a lot of this at knife, particularly as a defensive measure. measure. But now let's look at how you be offensive with it. And so we're going to look at um, what's termed at lunging. In knife, because it's nowhere near a safer weapon, you need to start from closer, you need to be far, you need to fire a much, a much faster lunge or a much faster motion because you can't cover yourself with the weapon. And if your opponent can defend by slipping counter cutting, that's what they're going to do. So uh, you do what's termed a demi lunge. Um, so a traditional lunge in say saber or foil or single stick um, in 19th century British sources at the very least is usually going from being two foot widths to being four foot widths. So what I want you to do with the demi lunge is you're basically going one foot width. It's a very, very short movement. Um, likewise, the method of lunging with knife, this is something um, Andre is specific about. He says, it's less like a foil lunge and more like throwing a punch. Um, this is in 19th century boxing from down here, the old school sort of guards. Um, but the timing of it is not quite fully extended then go because if I fully extend and then go, my opponent is going to whack me in the hand before I started my lunge. Um, and you know, constantly hunting to attack the knife hand, really common knife hunting. So what instead is I want to go, I want to, I don't want to step forward and then go because if I step forward, my opponent's going to stab me in the face for stepping forward. What I want to do is start my lunge when I'm about half extended. Um, which I find is the timing that I use when I throw jabs, although that might just be the <laughs> influence of fencing on my boxing. You know, so what we're going to do, we're just going to do just a basic vertical cut because that's the most common cut that I do in knife fighting. Um, and most people who do the same systems as me have all heard from me, so they all copy me. Um, so, yeah. But what don't you? Extend halfway when you're ha when you've got a half extend. Kick your foot out, then lunge and extend, and retract. And you notice as I'm retracting, like my recovery, I drop my hand all the way down as I come back. The reason for that is if I leave my hand out, my opponent's going to have a crack at it. So they're going to have a chop. So what I want to do is pull my hand down, and I want to make I want you to understand that when I'm doing this. That's not me hacking through my opponent. That's me delivering what is probably going to be a quite quick cut and then dropping my hand for defensive purposes. I'm pulling my hand out of distance. Not, um, you know, this is not like a big cleave or anything. Um, because, yeah, don't like getting cut in the hand. Um, or, well, really anywhere, but, you know, good, good to be able to attack and be safe. Um, all right, so let's practice that a few times. So half extend, kick, lunge and extend, recover. 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 And one thing that will happen when you're fighting is you will start to abbreviate the recovery. So, you know, rather than doing the full drop all the way down and pull back, you'll start doing it just dropping to here and just dropping less and less, particularly as you get a feel for um, how aggressive your opponent is and how willing they are to attack you. Um, and also once you get used to disengaging with the arm, there's also times where you'll deliberately leave it, your hand extended to bait to disengage and counter cut. Um, but I find it's good practice to practice the full um, drop, like bring your hand all the way down, because when you're bouting, you're going to get, your hand is going to get closer and closer to the danger zone because that's how you win. And if you practice like that, then your hand, when you actually go to bout, your hand will stay entirely in the danger zone. Important thing to remember, Drilling is not sparring, and sparring is not fighting. Um, you know, the things you do in each to make you bet, you know, the things you do in drilling to make, you, um, to make you better at sparring are not necessarily the same things you'll do in sparring. And the same is, well, 
Same is presumably true for fighting. It is true, definitely true of com of competing in combat sports. You know, you, you don't people in tournaments don't fence the same or box the same or mixed martial arts. Is that a verb now? Mixed martial arts the same as they do in training or they do in sparring, just because the context is different. All right. So let's practice that now as a smooth movement. So I'm going to call lunge. And I want you to do the whole motion in one go. So, lunge, 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 and lunge. All right. So that's your basic attacks um, and basic footwork in terms of the demi lunge. I'm just going to quickly grab a drink. Um, oh, and someone's asked, how long does this go? And Mick said, yeah. Basically, yeah, I think Mick's right. Like, these usually go about an hour and 15 minutes or so. Um, this one might go a little bit longer because <laughs> so I've got a little bit more material to cover, but not much longer than that. And if you have to duck off, you can watch the recording later. So, you know, I'm not going to be too upset. All right. Sweet. So... We've seen the basic attacks. Now let's talk about attacking and defending the primary target in knife in this knife system, and realistically most knife systems because of the nature of the weapon, the knife hand. Um, basically the knife doesn't have a guard, or well, these kinds of knives don't have guards, very short blades, um, you know, they, they don't really, there's not much intrinsic protection with the weapon. Um, and, one thing's like, I mean, I'm not going to be teaching parries tonight because parries are very much an advanced skill in knife fighting and something you only very you do only very occasionally. Um, your main your main defense comes from distance. In fact, knife fighting is a game of distance. And I guess, if, and also one thing I find actually, if you're you know a fencer of another type, like you do like long sword or epee or whatever, adding some knife fighting to your curriculum will really really help build your control of distance because knife fighting is all about distance. So primary target is the knife arm. Yeah. Um, I want to, one of the reasons actually I wanted my hand extended, I don't, I don't keep my hand back here is because it means that there is a single target forward. Um, I can do this where, you know, everything, the, you know, every target is back. The problem with that is it increases the likelihood of an attack to the leg or face or wherever else. Whereas here, I mean, my opponent can theoretically attack my head, but I can intercept them much more effectively from here than I can from here. And also, and also an opponent who knows what they're doing or has, you know, like the 15 to 20 minutes of, you know, it takes to get knowledgeable and competent with knife. Um, you know, is going to go my hand, but that has the advantage that I know where they're going to attack, so I know how to defend it. So, attacks the arm are pretty simple. I just punch at the arm. I mean, most of these we did at extension height. If I'm going to attack it, I just attack the lower. Defending is done in two ways. Through either what I would term a disengage, because it has the same motion as disengaging in foil or sabre, and slipping the hand. So my hand straight back to here. So let's look at the disengage. So in foil or sabre, I disengage from the wrist to move the weapon tip. Uh, because that doesn't actually change much, the knife is so short, there's not, like that's not a very big movement and we're not fighting from engagement. I need to disengage from the elbow. Like what you, know, you see here, I'm moving from my elbow to disengage and everything else is staying in pretty much a straight line. The other difference um, is the size of disengage. With this, obviously, I want to keep it as small as I can, but it's still going to be bigger because I need to, I'm using this to move my hand out of the way. So if you imagine someone's attacking my hand, I'm slipping out of the way. They're going to hit me. I'm going to move out of the way. And I need to take into account that they're going to swing, most likely going to swing through or stab through, or you know, even a thrust has a bit of angle to it. 
So I need to move enough that I avoid that completely. So let's just practice that. So from your medium guard, you just practice disengaging just back and forth. Usually when I, if you've got like a training partner that you can practice this stuff with, just practice, um, get them to slowly attack your arm um, just repeatedly, like just you know, gentle cuts. And you just practice disengaging under it to get used to the motion and get used to how big it is. But the idea with this is basically what I want is I want to disengage and then counter cut. Um, disengage just enough that my opponent misses me and then counter cut them. And the smaller the disengage, the more likely the counter cut is to land, but that comes with the added danger of the disengage might not be enough. And so the counter, you might, you know, so you might get hit. All right, so let's actually practice that. So let's actually practice disengaging and counter cutting. What I want you to do is disengage the outside, counter cut, back to guard, disengage to the inside, counter cut, and back to guard. Instantly, anything that comes in on my weapon side, it comes into my outside. Anything that comes in at my non-weapon side comes to my inside. It's just very basic fencing terminology. All right, so disengage the outside, counter cut. Disengage to the inside, counter cut. Show that from the side. When I disengage the outside, I throw, I don't come back to guard to throw. I just throw my cut from the disengage. Um, a lot of people point out cuts with knives often are just not particularly deep or effective because the weapon is so small and light. But coming all the way back to guard where I can thrust is really difficult. So you're better to get a small cut in than no cut at all. So disengage the outside, counter cut. Disengage the inside, counter cut. Disengage the outside, counter cut. Disengage the inside, counter cut. Show you that from the other side. Disengage the outside, counter cut. Disengage the inside, counter cut. Disengage the outside, counter cut. Disengage the inside, counter cut. All right. So this is one of your primary defenses. You're just going to pull your hand out of the way, twisting from the elbow. Um, the other is slipping the arm. To slip the arm, I also move from the elbow. But I pull my knife back um, in the drills, in the manual. And I think this is also the other reason Hutton has the hand high rather than down here. If my hand is low, there's a non-significant chance I'll hit my own hand. Uh, whereas if my hand is up here, I can pull my knife back. Um, Hutton much prefers this defense um, with the knife. Uh, in a lot of cases, the defense does. Lure manuals prefer attack <laughs> to defense. So. Um, but to show you that from the side, all I'm doing is turning from the elbow and bringing up, um, bring my knife and resting it just in front of my body. I find if I can make contact with um, the this part of my arm against my torso, I know that I'm never actually going to like hit myself with the knife, but I'll be as far back as I reasonably can be. So just make contact, make contact. And the other thing I find when you're doing this is a quick, you know, pulling your um, pulling your elbow is a quick jerk gives you a bit of extra speed, makes this a quicker movement. So I retract. Then the cut from this I find is quite intuitive, but we'll work on that in a moment. So let's practice the slip. So I'm just going to call out, and I want you to slip um, whenever I call. So slip and back to guard. 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 And slip and back to guard. Slip and back to guard. And slip and back to guard. All right. So now let's try uh, now let's try that with the return. So I want you to slip and come to the extension position, but I want you to, we're going to do this with a lunge. So we're actually going to slip, extend to half extension, and lunge. Because, you know, these slips are the one time that you can really, you've got a good chance of actually pulling the knife away and hitting your opponent as the knife travels through. Um, particularly if they've got a, if they drop their hand really far to protect the hand, like a sensible person, 
if you've got a very quick launch, you can slip and occasionally get them in the head if you're quick. I've got a question, I might just quickly check that. Okay, cool, that's just some bone of history, that's good. All right, so let's practice that as a combo. Keep going to fucking saber. It's not a saber, it's a bone. All right, so slip and half extension, kick and extend, and back to guard. Slip. Half extension, kick, lunge, back to guard. Slip, lunge, slip, lunge, slip, lunge, slip, lunge, slip, lunge, slip, lunge. And once more for like, slip, lunge. All right, let's try and bring some of that together into a combination. Um, Obviously, if you're at home and you, you want something to practice in between lessons, doing shadow boxing the knife where you practiced disengaging, um, slipping, and cutting is really, really useful. But I'm just going to call out one of the commands. So I'm going to check questions first just because I think a few have popped up in the chat. And then I'm, we're going to do a random drill. All right. Cool. All right, just cool. <laughs> Definitely check the comment, the comments for this because yeah, there's some wonderful discussion by knife history that I'll comment on at the end. All right, so from here we're going to come on guard. What I'm going to do is I'm going to call either outside disengage, inside disengage, slip, or cut. Well, actually, let's make it even more complex. I'm occasionally going to call lunge, in which case you have to cut on the lunge. And what I want you to do. And what we're going to do, what I want you to do is focus on moving between the positions um, as smoothly as possible. And these are going to be random. They don't represent necessarily what you're going to do in a fight. But the idea is to build um, basically a, movement vocab a versatile movement vocabulary where you can go from like an outside disengage to a slip, to an, in you know, to an inside disengage, to an outside disengage, to a lunge, to a cut, to a slip to an inside disengage. No, nope. <laughs> you won't want to follow that along. I'll do, it. I'll do it a lot slower. All right, so let's begin. So I want you to slip, inside disengage. So come back to guard and then disengage. Outside disengage, cut, cut. You can change the angle, it doesn't really matter. Just whatever you feel. Cut, slip, outside disengage, lunge. Inside disengage, lunge. Outside disengage, slip, lunge. Cut. Cut, slip, inside disengage, outside disengage, lunge, cut, slip, outside disengage, and lunge. Cool, so hopefully the randomness of that will help set things in your mind a bit and also help you just move between them because a lot of moving be moving between defense and attack quickly um, is quite important because this is very much a weapon. Well, speed is very much a factor in you know, knife fighting. Cool. All right. Sweet. So now, what have we got next on the agenda for lesson? So now let's look at defending pretty much everywhere else because, you know, you're not always going to be attacked in the arm, mostly. You're going to be attacked in maybe the leg or the head or the body. And the defense for this is really, is pretty much identical. You have almost a universal defense to everything that is not the knife hand and that's to slip and counter cut. So if someone attacks my leg, I slip and counter cut. If someone attacks my head, I slip and counter cut. If someone attacks my, uh, my belly, I slip. In this case, it's a counter thrust, but you know, it could just easily be a counter cut. I just find it's a bit more natural. Um, the reason being is the knife is so short that you know 
just moving this what is a small amount of distance is enough to get my is enough to get me well clear. It's not like a sword where an opponent could you know add an extra add in a little little bit of extra distance and still hit me if I slipped. Um, you know, I can get really, really clear and also the speed of the knife means that I can counter cut and deter um, a committed opponent. So yeah, like people who die, you know, who go deep as an opening attack knife tend not to do very well, which is why I emphasize attacking the knife hand. So let's have a look at the motion slip. There are two types of slip that you can do or slipping of the legs in 19th century um, fencing. Uh, the first is much more traditionally British, uh, where I just spring to what's called first position, a spring to bolt upright. The advantage of this is because I'm basically, I'm almost jumping. It's very, very quick to slip. The disadvantage is if I want to lunge from here, I have to rebend my knees and go, so my return is going to be slower. The alternative, uh, which you see more in continental styles of fencing, while well, you do see both in everywhere, um, is to slip and bring my knees together. So I actually let my foot, just come a bit forward so you can actually see my foot properly, my foot drift all the way behind me, but I'm keeping my knees together um, so that I'm not actually, I'm not stepping back, I'm not actually going backwards. I'm basically just getting my, my leg and my body out of the way the advantage of this is because my knees are still bent and also because I can kick my leg out to propel myself forward, I've got a faster return. Which you're going to use is mostly going to be up to you. I, To be honest, I tend to do this a lot more than I do this, but that's just me. You might find something else works better for you. So let's work on the, fir on the first type of slip. This is kind of your more sort of jumpy slip. So all I want you to do is I'm going to call slip. I want you to spring and extend. So slip, spring, and extend. Um, the timing of the knife is not actually hugely important um, unless you're, you probably, you want to make sure that you've already started your movement before you extend, but the actual timing of when you go, you go with your knife attack is going to vary quite a bit depending on what your opponent's doing which makes it very hard to teach in an internet lesson. So, slip and extend. Slip and extend. Slip and extend. Slip and extend. And slip and extend. Now, slipping and extending like that generally assumes your opponent is attacking basically from sort of the nipples down, which often they are. If they're going for your head on the other hand, like a high tiger, like the head or neck, you want to th basically thrust upwards. So all I'm doing, same punching movement that I've done for all of my other cuts, except I'm coming to this position. And what I'm actually doing is I'm whipping the tip up with you know the force of my punch. Now I don't want to necessarily shank because that's slower. It's more of a whip. In fact, all cuts are basically punch and whip. Punch, whip. So let's try that. So slip and thrust upwards. Slip and thrust upwards. Slip and thrust upwards. Slip and thrust upwards. And slip and thrust upwards. And yeah, you can use rising cuts. The reason I don't is I find that this keeps my hand relatively clear of my opponent, whereas doing this risks a double more than I personally like. All right, now let's look at the other type of slip. So what I'm doing with this is I'm pulling my weight back. I mean, I'm pushing off my front foot a little, but I'm more by rolling my, my rolling my foot. So lifting my toes up to move my weight back and then flicking my foot back. And this is a little slower, but you know, stronger return. So, and let's practice that with just an extension just to make sure that we're practicing cutting as we slip. So, slip and back, slip and back, slip and back, and slip and back. 
All right, so let's now try that. We let's now try that in combination. So we're going to slip, and then we're going to lunge. Because you know, which also is just a cool thing to do as a bit of a workout. So slip, kick, extend, and lunge. And I want you to, by the time you foot, the timing of it is by the time your foot gets to stance, you should be half extended, and by the time your foot gets to kind of lunge you know, this sort of lunge position should be fully extended. It's not easy to get the timing exactly right. Um, but the more practice you do, the more likely you're going to be close to be close to per or close enough to perfect in um, a fight that it doesn't matter that you're going to be successful in what you're trying to do. All right, so slip and lunge <laughs> and back to guard. Slip and lunge, 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 slip and lunge. So weird doing this as a drill because I'm so used to pulling my knife back when I do it. If you start instinctively retracting your knife with the slip as well, that's cool because that's what you're going to be doing when you're fencing with this. All right, so let's just do a few more. Slip and lunge. Slip and lunge. Slip and lunge. And slip and lunge. And back to guard. All right, cool. Um, just quickly while I get a drink. So Mix asked, when you slip, when you lunge after you slip, is that a push cart at the hand? Um, it can be. Basically, something I should have mentioned at the start of the class, if I don't specify what cut to do, um, it's because you can pretty much do it. You can pretty much do any, um, or at the very least, the sit. You know, the situation is so variable that you don't want to be training a specific cut. You want to kind of learn to adapt on the fly, um, which is the frustrating thing about knife is every weapon learns with. You know, you need to do an amount of sparring or amount of bouting to to learn with. Uh, where you know, with saber, it's like fifty, you know, fifty or sixty percent bouting um, to learn how to use it. Um, Epe probably forty-five to sixty percent bouting. With knife, it's closer to eighty. You know, like pro the proper learning ratio is about eighty percent bouting because there's not a lot of depth per se. Well, there's not a lot of breadth of the technique of techniques. There's not that many techniques you need to learn, um, and most knife systems are pretty simple. Like it, it's really, it's really difficult to overcomplicate knife. Um, but judgment and reflexes are so important that you basically need to be constantly trying to build those. And most of the sort of the drills I do when I when train with partners um, with for knife are about building sort of judgment and reflexes and distance, rather than you know just learning lots of, you know, learning um, techniques. Uh, cool. So Bill wants to know what fencing treaties are you using for training with the bow based on? Um, so primarily for me, I didn't have, I did actually post them in the Facebook event, um, all links to them, but yeah, I'm primarily using um, Renault, uh, who's a defense lens guru practitioner, Andre is another defense dancer or a practitioner, who, both of whom give fairly general advice about the knife. Um, and then the main sort of technical source I'm using is Alfred Hutton's Cold Steel, where he has, he calls it dagger. Um, it works perfectly well with knife, um, although he, um, it also, he also, you know, does it with parrying daggers where you can actually parry, which is interesting. Um, but Hutton says this is for, you know, the sorts of knives issued to soldiers, like, you know, bowing knife type things. So totally worth a read. But yeah, um, basically 
Cold, Alfred Hutton's Cold Steel and um, Andre and Renault. Um, and they're all, they should all be in the Facebook event if you go and have a look in the discussion tab. All right, cool. So now let's look at sneakiness. So, you know, it's one thing to judge distance and um, I'll, do another, I'll do another distance lesson sometime soon just because it's super important. It's another to be able to manipulate it. And I actually, if you want to get good at manipulating distance, um, you know, learning the theory is nice, but that takes, you know, that's all of like, you know, one, you know, one to five pub conversations, depending on your alcohol tolerance. Whereas actually manipulating distance is much more complicated. And the way you do that, that is through footwork and bodywork. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the sneakiness I use, which is weight shifting. So if I'm controlling distance, I don't necessarily want to step because that's big and obvious and my opponent can see me do it. What do I want to do on the other hand? And shift my weight because it's a lot less obvious. Like you see how it's a much smaller movement. And if I'm already moving around, like moving back and forth, you might not necessarily see that I've shifted my weight. So... Just to show you, um, when I'm in my standard stance, my my weight is mid-weighted. I want the maximum versatility as to where I can move my weight. I don't want to sit, I don't want to be back-weighted because then all I can do is go forward, which I might not want. Um, like a particularly aggressive opponent can take advantage of that. I don't want to be forward-weighted, um, mostly mostly because I find it's all uh, can be difficult to launch me. Actually, with knife, you kind of do. Knife, you can get away with being forward weighted, whereas with like Sabre and Epe, not so much, only in very specific situations. Knife, on the other hand, you can fight with forward foot, um, but I, I find when you do that, it's harder to sneak closer. So I like to be mid weighted. But if, and then from here, if I want to draw my opponent out, if I want to make them feel like they're out of distance even when they're not, shift my weight. And it can be very subtle or very noticeable, or more noticeable from the side. It's a very subtle thing. So let's practice that. So what I want you to do is in your stance, I want you to just practice rocking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the other thing you want to do you do this is if you see how um, with the vines behind me I'm trying to keep my head level I want to make sure that I'm not arcing up a little bit downwards arc is actually can actually work like a small downwards arc can work because it can mess with perspective um, but I've never gotten that that far into it I just find like transitioning keeping my head level is enough to make what I'm doing not particularly obvious what you want to do when all the times I do this is when I'm when I'm fencing I'll transition back and I'll do like a very small defensive movement and my opponent will be like but and my opponent will try and take into account my small defensive movement. I'll show that from the front it's maybe more obvious see how my hand is just drifting over very slightly whereas normally I do this you know be pulling all the way back this I'm like not pulling properly far. And I've had a lot of people complain that they feel like they're out of distance when fencing me um, because of this, so it definitely works. I just do a small pullback. I come back to guard. Small pullback and back to guard. Small pullback and back to guard. And the reason I'm not necessarily reposting every time is I'm trying to make my opponent feel like they're out of distance, feel like they're too far away, even though they're not or to question their ability to judge distance. And then I'll pull back and I'll repost with a lunge, repost deep. And this is probably the best way to get, if you're gonna nail someone in the head, this is one of the, the tricks to doing it, is making them either overcommit or fall short. Alternatively, feel safe. In a lot of cases, people go, oh, well, if I'm this far away, you know, I'm definitely safe, but you're not. So let's practice that. So I want you to shift back and come back to guard. Shift back 
and come back to guard. Shift back and lunge and back to guard. So I'm going to call the lunges a bit randomly just for mostly my... Well, actually, no, it is good technique, but it also, I just kind of enjoy doing that to mess with you. Shift back and back to guard. Shift back and lunge. Shift back and back to guard. Shift back and back to guard. Shift back and back to guard. Shift back and lunge and back to guard. And shift back and back to guard. Shift back and back to guard. Shift back and lunge. And once more for luck, I want you to shift back and lunge. All right. So those little sort of distance tricks and distance traps are really, really useful. Um, and if you're doing knife, this is a big part of what, like a big part of what you want to do is focus on distance and focus on um, building footwork. And honestly, if you're doing knife training at home, um, probably about half your training, you know, half your training is just going to be general sort of fencing footwork training. You know, even go on to YouTube and just get some. Look for fencing footwork drills. It doesn't matter if they're for historical fencing, modern Olympic fencing, if they're for say, modern Olympic sabre, modern Olympic epee, modern Olympic foil, historic, you know, 19th century sabre. Um, I mean, you can, as long as they're not like kendo or kendo or long sword or something. Um, although even then, like, I mean, you can see you can see the boxing influence of my footwork when I knife a lot more than you can see it in any other weapon um, because it's hard and it's hard to sort of get to remove something that is so entirely useful. Um, cool. So, are there any questions that I haven't already answered? Um, we sort of had <laughs> I saw these big posts. I'm like, oh gosh, I've, I've completely forgotten something. There's people having a lovely chat about bowing knife in the comments, which is really really cool. It's nice, you know. Hello, well, everyone. Everyone's here to like each other. This is really adorable. You guys are great. Uh, let's see. Cool. So, I just got a comment about what a Bowie knife is, which is cool because I am, thank you, Tony. I'm actually not so good when it comes to material culture. Like, you know, a lot of people, like, you know, Matt Easton's since that really get into the physical objects, whereas I'm much more interested in the history, like the co social and cultural history around them, which means. Um, I'm not I'm not always super specific when it comes to what exactly the stuff I'm using is. I'm usually just going, all right, I'm just going to take, I'm just going to summarize what I've heard from other people. Uh, but yeah, so Tony's point out, a bow knife is a pattern of fixed blade fighting created by uh, James Black in the early 19th century for Jim Bowie. Uh, so that's a fighting knife um, who'd become on the, who um, who'd become famous for, for his use of a long knife, a jewel known as the standby fight. Yeah, so this is really talk. I think you talk, might be talking about a specific bow there, Tony, but that's cool. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's actually what's interesting. Something um, Matt Easton's point out in one of his videos is that carrying knives for reasons. <laughs> I'd say self. Everyone says self defense, but you know, like the, I, I know I, I find that. Historically, it's probably a bit more shady than that. But um, like even quite well-do gentlemen were carrying knives in the 19th century, like but you know things these length, like proper Bowie knife type things um, in Britain. And a lot of the knife, especially a lot of the knives, the knives were being made in Britain at the time and then exported, um, which you know is kind of cool. But there was also sort of the romanticism of the American West and the sand, you know the sandbar fight and things like that. Um, had really taken root in Britain as well. So, you know, it's not it's not entirely unlikely that someone who had done the systems, who had read Cold Steel, who might have played with some knife in a fencing room, actually did this against an opponent. Um, the one actually that interests me in terms of like historical uses of this is actually in World War One. If someone, you know, if um, people who had done, um, you know, had done knife in the fencing room end up using it in the trenches. Um, although part of that musing is, um, I don't know if anyone's seen the trailer for The King's Man, which is a prequel to the Kingsman films that is coming out eventually. <laughs> um, there's some knife, there's a lot, there's a lot of knife fighting in the trailer, and a lot of from looks at things, a lot of knife fighting in that, which just looks really freaking cool. So, 
you know, Bill's point out, yeah, Sheffield knives are imported from England. Um, reverse to eight blade designs and links. Yep, yeah. Um, oh, definitely. I think that was what the Matt Easton video was about. So, yeah, very cool. Um, this is. And Tony's also pointing out, um, Shul Blade had no clipped edge, apparently. It was designed as a hunting blade uh, by some guy that the Bowie's brother employed, but like, supposedly designed the, the knife style based on uh, knife Bowie later designs, let me know, eight years after Bowie first, uh, Bowie's first duel. So it's sort of the comment's a bit longer than Restream allows me to um, put up. But yeah, uh, that's cool. All right, so does anyone else have any questions about uh, the techniques we study tonight or um, just about Bowie knives generally or, you know, even about the sources? I can talk more about, like, the sources, you know, the source I use for this. Um, doubly so, because I think, like, I think it is worth pointing out that um, in the 19th century in Europe, knife dueling was not uncommon, but it was primarily a working class thing. So, like all around the Mediterranean, um, knife dueling amongst work, like like working class and like proper like lower class kind of people was um, fairly common. And certainly, you know, um, there's the Baratero of Spain. Um, if you get a chance to read uh, James Rand's translation of Manuel de Baratero, it's really really cool and interesting because it's one of the few. It's like the only technical manual or technical source we have for um, any working class knife tradition. Um, everything else we know about them basically comes from you know, living, like living lineages that continued up until now. Um, but yeah, you have the Baratero of Spain, but also all, like all through Italy, stiletto dueling was apparently really common. There's actually, um, there are like defense dance Leroux practitioners and fencing masters and, you know, um, good middle class fencing masters who say, you know, if you get, if you want to be complete in your fencing, um, go and learn some Italian stiletto. Uh, it was a big thing in Greece, apparently, was um, knife dueling. Um, you know, it was, um, you'd, you know, you'd, um, you'd use the same, and you'd use the same kind of knife that you use for work. Um, apparently butchers were the most feared knife fighters, um, which is kind of cool. Um, certainly if you've seen the film Gangs of New York, you know, the main villain of that is a butcher and is famous for his knife fighting. Um, but in Greece, that was the case. Um, the other interesting thing about it was, um, even though, like, um, Dueling was illegal, like you'd get done for um, assault, but you just go in and you'd plead guilty, and the, the actual sentence was quite low because so many people, <laughs> so many people were arrested for assault that, um, yeah, they, um, you know, that it actually just became part of the, um, you know, just became part of um, the tradition of dueling is you'd go and you confess, you confessed all you did, and um, like, pleading guilty to the crimes, to the accusations, was a big part of, um, you know, was a bit like, was actually a big part of um, basically bragging about it. So, you know, you go and you plead guilty um, because that was, you know, that was sort of a way of being recognised that you won the duel, which I find really, really interesting. Um, and then, yeah, and once once you get sort of further around the Mediterranean, I don't know about the I don't know about the Middle East. I'd be very interested to know if there's like knife traditions from sort of like Lebanon and um, well, <laughs> it, it now what is now like Israel and still a bit Palestine, but um, was back then you know back in the nineteenth century was just Palestine. Well, it was all under the Ottoman Empire. Um, <laughs> wow, well, but yeah, like if there's you know sort of there's knife traditions from there. Um, certainly, once you get into um, North Africa, as we found out um, the other week when we had um, Eric, when I talked to Adam Muries, it was mostly stick fighting through there, which is kind of cool. Uh, anyway, yeah, so I've got a few more comments. Um, sorry, someone said the history of American Bowie. You should check out a book by Kircher. I will give that a look because I know a lot less about Amer like um, you know American like or with martial arts that arose in America that I'd like. Um, I mean, the main, you know, the only manual I've actually read is um, Thomas Hoyer Monstry, who in his fencing school did teach both um, Bowie knife and Spanish knife. Um, I don't know what Spanish knife refers to, but he taught it, um, but never wrote down how to do it, which is kind of sad. Um, yeah, someone's also mentioned uh, Dwight Mecklemore or Mc Mckelmore, Dwight, I'm, yeah, I don't know if it's Dwight Mecklemore or Dwight Mckelmore. Um, 
either way. Um, yeah, his book is his book um, has been quite influential. I should be clear, it's a modern book, so it's not in like a 19th century source. Um, but then again, there are a lot of 20th century. In fact, there's a lot of 20th century Bowie manuals um, as military manuals. Um, you know, in the US, there's like well, I mean, Fairburn talked about it with his machete. Um, there's also like um, there's also Sykes um, who has you know, his Bowie knife as part like a really simple sort of Bowie knife method as part of his manual called which is also called Cold Steel. Um, yeah, so you get into the 20th century. There's a lot more kind of uh, Bowie knife stuff. Either as a here's a simple trick you can do if you ever need to knife fight through to hey knife fighting is cool and fun and let's do it but not with real knives but with instead with padded knives. Um, you know, because yeah, like this is a lot, fencing with these is just a lot of fun. Like I'm not, um, I had a weird conversation with a guy actually talking about knives. He was talking about like knives he carries and like, well, you, and he asked me if, what knife I carry, which jumping straight to the conclusion that I carry a knife. And, um, so I got, um, a pair of padded knives I keep in my bag just in case, you know, I want to, um, do some sparring with someone. I'm like, these are so much fun and you can hit people and it's completely safe and you didn't really know how to react. Um, but yeah, like, I don't know. Um, yeah, like hopefully this workshop is at the very least inspire you to sort of give some of the fencing stuff a try um, when we can meet up in person. All right. So Bill Anson said Spanish knife is also known as Navaja. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that is the sort of the infamous Spanish knife is the Navaja. I don't know that's what um, Monstry was talking about. Um, like, I don't know for sure, and he is in the US. Um, and I don't know if he's talking about a knife fighting system. Like he just advertises Spanish knife. He doesn't say if it's like, if he's referring to the techniques of fencing or if he's referring to a specific weapon. Um, whereas Navaja is, is, is a specific type of knife. So yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's what he was referring to. The source is not clear. And I'm not comfortable saying, okay, oh, the knife he's referring to is a Navaja. Um, Cool. Yes, and Bill's also pointed out it was used by all well, the Baratero, which is a criminal, kind of a criminal class. Um, well, um, yeah, so, and that is, I mean, I think apparently that's, you know, just single thing. But like I was saying, knife fighting was a working class tradition through most of the Mediterranean. Apparently also in the Netherlands, um, I've heard that there's people who are doing like um, Dutch knife fighting. There's, Part of this sort of living tradition that's basically lasted up until or was still going is still going now um although it's being sort of formalized and kind of i guess humorized i don't know if that's a term but there's a point where your living tradition um your living tradition knife um system essentially just becomes part of hema practice um because it's no longer used for dueling and becomes used for fun um which yeah so um, that's and that's actually happening to a lot of European knife traditions where they're going, they're sort of being preserved as essentially preserved through the process of becoming a HEMA um, because people aren't, you know, injuring each other with knife anymore, um, but people will still want to train in it because, like I said, this is just a lot of fun. Like, people ask you, why do you train knife? And I'm, I'm never going to use a knife in self defense. Like, I don't know. Like I have like I've like a kitchen knife, a craft knife in my home, and if someone breaks into my home, if someone breaks into my home, I'm going to look at them despondently because they've walked into a house full of swords. Um, you know, like I'm not, you know, I'm not ever going to actually fight with any of this. But training it is a lot of fun. These are a really wonderful game of reflexes. Um, anyway, so Mix asked. Um, what's the name of Monstry's book and how do you spell his name? Uh, I will post the book to the Facebook event. Um, I might, actually, I'll get it up on screen just for the people who are watching on YouTube, who might, because I know there's a bunch of people who follow us on YouTube that don't use Facebook at all. So if you just give me a sec. So this is the book. So self-defense for ladies and gentlemen by Colonel Thomas Hoyer Monstry, um, which has been compiled by Ben Miller. Uh, so for those who don't know, Ben Miller is um, probably one of the most prolific um, finders and, um, you know, catalogers of historical art, 
historical artwork and artifacts. Like I see stuff from him all the time. It's great. All right, cool. And Christopher Lee has also put that up. So I'll put, I'll just leave that up um, for a moment, just in case anyone wants to, um, anyone wants to sort of copy it out and uh, find it. But yeah, Monstry is really interesting. Um, I think something to be very clear about with Monstry is that he's not necessarily representative of the orthodox tradition of um, European martial arts. Like his boxing is, by his own confession, quite different, or a bit different to what was being practiced in boxing gyms in the time at the time. Uh, for that, you probably want uh, Ned, like Ned Donnelly's book, um, or you know, um, even uh, Major Elliot. Um, you know, who are listing very much more standard methods. Percy Longhurst is has a much has probably um, a, a boxing manual that has much more normal techniques or much more commonly used techniques, but the training is really good. Like, um, a, you know, when you read some of the ways he talks about teaching boxing, it's um, yeah, it you know, it's um, actually quite ahead of its time in terms of you know basically getting people to learn by resistance and adaptation rather than by like sitting in lines and punching the air, uh, which is cool. All right, cool. And then, yeah, Tony's mentioned Oko, the, uh, Mar the Marquis of Queensbury. Yep. Yes, no, Queensbury rules was a big thing as well. Um, yeah, but no, like, I think it is important when we're talking about manuals to understand what is and isn't common, particularly when you get to the 19th century, there is, if someone has an unorthodox method, they're often very likely to publish it, and there is a tendency to him on in him to focus on uh, things that are a bit more unorthodox, like the mainstream boxing manuals I mentioned. Um, some of them you can actually find in libraries, like libraries or antique bookshops, because um, they're fairly common. Whereas Monstry, who's being republished, um, is less orthodox, but yeah, at the same time, like he does have some really good, you know, if you're looking for like technical fighting advice, particularly, he's got some really good stuff in there um, about like, you know, how to, you know, condition your fists, how to learn to, how to hit, like the biomechanics of it. Um, I also think his stuff's a bit better, like from a self defense if you're interested in self defense -y stuff, his boxing's a bit better because it is, it works, it does work more effectively against an untrained opponent. Um, you know, in terms of just like ending, like knowing how to end a fight quicker, which is cool. And he talk, he talks about some stuff that was uh, common, that was actually common in the 19th century, but never written down. Um, so he talks about rough and tumble, which is kind of this um, like working class, American working class um, unarmed fighting tradition that is based on mostly like, apparently had a lot of gouging and biting and a lot of like, it's sort of clinch fighting, but you do something really vicious to make everyone scared of you. Um, like, you know, fish hooks and plucking at eyes and stuff. I don't know how much of this is just, is rumor as, oh, like, are just stories about how barbaric the working class is, as opposed to, um, you know, as opposed to, you know, an actual documented technique, but there you go. Uh, he also does describe kicking and knocking, um, which is, you know, um, African diaspora martial art, which is really cool. Um, if you can check out, like, Damon Stith has done a lot of work reconstructing that. Um, which is really, really cool. Um, sorry, uh, oh yeah, Damon Stith um, has done a lot of work on reconstructing rough and tumble, not rough and tumble, I'm oh, sorry, not rough and tumble, um, kicking and knocking, he's, he's done a lot of work on that. But if you just look up, um, if you just look up Hamer, H-A-M-A -A on YouTube, you'll find videos about it and it's really, really cool. Um, unfortunately, Monstry being, or well, I mean, it's not, Saying he's a product of time is a cop out. There were plenty of people who weren't racist in the 19th century, but the way he described, unfortunately, the way he describes um, black martial arts or like African, you know, African diaspora martial arts in the 19th century is um, quite racist. Um, doubly so because he actually says that kicking and knocking is kind of like a Danish headbutting art. Except it's not because, um, in his view, you know, black people weren't capable of sophisticated systems, whereas Europeans were. So, yeah, like, <laughs> just content warning: there is some old-timey racism in Mont Street, but like, still very interesting source, um, nonetheless. Um, I, don't know. I actually like 
uh, if you look up the videos of what, like, kick, based on more, you know, more specific sources, what kicking and knocking actually was, it actually it makes an incredible amount of sense because, you know, it basically fills in all of the gaps in um, 19th century martial arts. So there's not a lot of um, punching necessarily because um, you'd probably learn that in boxing or at least be fighting people who knew how to do it. Um, but there's a lot of, like, head butts and shoulder barges and obviously a lot of kicks which are the things that are very uncommon in 19th century European martial arts. So, you know, you've got people who are like, oh, you know, what are these people not doing? You know, like if, if they're going to throw punches, I'm just going to, I'm going to throw more kicks. You know, if they're going to like grab and wrestle, then I'm going to take advantage of that with headbutts. Um, and it is really, really cool because it basically, um, it basically finds all of the gaps in um, unarmed European arts and um, perfects how to take advantage of them. It's a really interesting thing. Um, all right, cool. Anyway. Um, if there's no more comments, I might sort of round the night out. So, um, first off, um, so as much as, you know, I'm going to be doing this for free um, for the duration of COVID, we do have a few small overheads, not the least of which is buying a license to use Restream, which is the streaming software I use. Uh, so if you, can make a, if you can make a donation to the Old Soul Club, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, just, you know, whatever you can spare, um, if you, you know, and yeah, hopefully, and that's going to go towards the running of the club. So, you know, that's you know, obviously um, restream licenses, insurance, and haul high when we start back up. Um, it might go towards buying um, equipment, um, like buying, well, buying me equipment specifically, um, if I need, you know, if I'm doing something special, but again, like, I don't want, you know, I'd rather this money go towards something for um that's going to benefit everyone so you know whatever you can spare is going to help um certainly help me make more of these videos on that um you know in a couple of minutes after i finish up i'm going to jump on um our zoom and we're just going to sit and chill i know there's a lot there's a lot of discussion on um not on like um nice stuff in the comments already so if you all want to continue that discussion in the zoom that'd be uh, fantastic um, and then on top of that, um, we're meeting again with the next one of these is going to be Sunday. We're going to be looking at 20th century fencing and how fencing changed uh, throughout the 20th century, which I think is kind of solely elected. But as a modern history, modern historian, you know, I, I probably have a bit of bias towards my um, my period. Anyway, um, so I'm going to so there should be the details of the Zoom in. Um, the Facebook event, or you can get them out of the comments of the chat, um, or in the, the video description if you're on YouTube. So yeah, hopefully jump on Zoom, and um, I'll see you all 